normally at this time in the worship service, we would have been uh, receiving the offering. So I want to talk about that uh, just a little bit right now uh, and encourage you in that way. Uh, a great privilege to reflect the glory and greatness of our God in, in our giving. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So we worship God gives and uh, we reflect back to him uh, that aspect of his character as we become givers as well. Uh, at Rich Palm, we've been doing really well so far this year through the second Sunday in March, the last Sunday we gathered. We were ahead of the budget. Seriously, we were. Uh, it's been a while since we could say that, that far into the new year, uh, but, but we were. Uh, we're not ahead today because uh, last Sunday hit a little hard uh, in our defense. I think we're all just finding our feet with this new normal. But I definitely want to encourage you to be faithful to give, not only just so that we can um, keep ministry going, that's really crucial and important here at Rich Pond and, and locally with opportunities to serve in our community, but we have a, a huge responsibility to hold the ropes for our missionaries around the globe, and they are dependent on the faithful giving in the local churches here in the state. So I just want to encourage you to be faithful. You can go online to the homepage of our, of our webpage, and you can, you can uh, give online there. And then you can also just uh, write out your check and uh, mail it in. I'm still writing my checks and bringing them in because the church office is, is, uh, is open for me at least. So I um, encourage you to be faithful in giving. Um, one of the more interesting books that I read in the last year was a book called Second Mountain by David Brooks. Uh, I think I cited this book maybe once before in preaching and uh, I'm, I'm not, by doing this, I'm not commending this book to you. There are, I think, some issues with it, but I think uh, David Brooks, who's a columnist for the New York Times, points us in the right direction, and kind of the cry of his heart that you hear in this book uh, is a cry that's common uh, to the hearts of humanity, and they point us back to the God who, who made us. This book, Second Mountain, really has a, a kind of a simple concept to it, he says a lot of people embrace adulthood looking for um, success and, uh, and to build a reputation, uh, to acquire some things and some wealth, maybe a family, and, uh, and to be successful in accomplishing goals that they set. That's kind of the first mountain reality. So young adults set out to make a mark in the world, uh, to get some things gathered for themselves. Uh, that first mountain tends to be... Uh, pretty self-oriented. I want these things, and I intend to go get them. Uh, and then Brooks says, though, at some point uh, later on in life, uh, something tends to happen that points them to a second mountain with a, with a valley in between. It may be they climb the first mountain and they realize that um, it really just didn't satisfy. Uh, or they got knocked off the mountain by some failure or some tragedy occurred in their lives, and and in that tragedy, they no longer found uh, that success uh, to do for them what it, what it had earlier done. And then they find um, a new direction in their life. And, uh, and, so, and so I just want to share some of these words here. These seasons of suffering have a way of exposing the deepest part of ourselves and reminding us that we're not the people we thought we were. People in the valley have been broken up. They've been broken open. They've been reminded that they are not just the parts of themselves that they put on display. There is another layer to them. They have been neglecting the substrate where the dark wounds and most powerful yearnings live. Some shrivel in the face of this kind of suffering. They seem to get more afraid and more resentful. They shrink away from their inner depths in fear their lives become smaller and lonelier. We all know old people who nurse eternal grievances. They don't get the respect they deserve. They live their lives as an endless tantrum about some wrong done to them long ago. But for others, this valley is the making of them. The season of suffering interrupts the superficial flow of everyday life. They see deeper into themselves and realize that down in the substrate flowing from all the tender places, there is a fundamental ability to care, a yearning to transcend the self and care for others. And when they have encountered this yearning, they are ready to become a whole person. 
I don't think Brooks gets us all the way home. But he does point us in the right direction. He does let us know that in every human heart there is a, there's a yearning, there's a longing for something more. And as believers in Christ, we, we kind of know what the yearning is. Uh, but there's a temptation for us to take that yearning, that desire, that longing in our hearts, even the longing for joy and meaning and purpose, and put it on something less than the God who made us. Um, and when we do that, it is really the ruin of our lives. It squeezes uh, the spiritual life out of us. Um, so this morning we're looking at a text that really calls us back uh, to a faithful and fruitful life in Christ. I'm going to read the whole parable of the sower, or at least the whole explanation of the parable of the sower that Jesus gives in Matthew 13. So find that Matthew 13, verse 18. I'll read through verse 23, although most of my commenting will pick it up in verse 22. So Matthew 8, Matthew 13, 18. This is the word of the Lord. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone, anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Let's pray. Father, would you, by your Spirit, open our eyes to see the glory, the goodness, the absolute truth of your word. Lord, we agree with that church, Father, that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So would you work that rest in us for your glory and for our joy we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to divide this explanation by Jesus just into two parts. The first part is the, the horror of the fruitless life. And the second part is the glory of the fruitful life. Just, just two parts. And uh, th the three soils that we get in this explanation, those are the horror of the fruitless life. A life that does not bear fruit to the glory of God. Why would I call it a horror? Uh, well, what we're made for is to bring glory to the God who made us. That's the very purpose of your life, the reason there's breath in your lungs, the reason that there is blood in your veins is to glorify the God who made you. And if you're a Christian today who, who remade you through the gospel, that's your purpose. And if you're not bearing fruit in that way, then you're falling short of what God made you for. You're, you're missing out on what should have been your destiny, your, your, your purpose. Now, the other aspect of this, and this is a horror as well, is that judgment falls on those that do not bear fruit. And you might be saying, well, I've looked at the parable. I don't see anything about judgment in there. It doesn't say anything. It talks about choking and no, and no root and those kinds of things. And and uh, it talks about those that did bear fruit, but it doesn't talk about the destiny of those that do not. And, and it doesn't because it doesn't have to because the words already describe that for us. You find it in Matthew 3, I think it's verse 10, where John the Baptist says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then you find it again in chapter 7, I think it's verse 19, Jesus says the same thing. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so the fruitless life is, is a horror. And I wouldn't be any kind of preacher if I didn't warn you about that. So the first soil is this hard ground where the word of God doesn't penetrate. There is no understanding. In fact, it says uh, 
he hears the word of God and does not understand it. And then the evil one comes and snatches the word away. So there's no penetration. There's no understanding. There's no profession of faith. There's no response to the gospel in faith. And so if there's no life through conversion, then there can't be any bearing spiritual fruit. It's not going to happen. And so this life misses out on God's plan and purpose and and longing for it and uh, dies under judgment with no fruit. Uh, The second two soils, the second soil, I think, is, um, is where it gets dangerous. Because it says there's an immediate, quick response to the gospel, and it receives it with joy. This person receives the gospel with joy. But when trouble comes, when tribulation occurs, persecution on account of the word, they, they, they wither, they scorch, they fall away, and they don't bear fruit either. And, and one, of the, one of the real dangers with this particular type of soil is we don't have a lot of tribulation or persecution And so we don't feel the scorching heat of those troubles. And so maybe we don't have any root, but we can't realize it because we don't have those external circumstances. It may be that part of what God is doing in the present circumstance that is dark and difficult and hard for us, it may be that he's exposing that for some among us, there's there's not any root there. And so the withering and scorching response to this is, is exposing the reality that we don't know Christ and we need to repent and believe this gospel. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be harsh or difficult or hard or anything like that. I mean by this to love you well, that that's crucial for you to get that settled. And under the difficulty, the hardship of this present trouble, maybe God is exposing the rootlessness of your own life and you should come to Christ and find life in him. So that's the first part of this horror of the fruitless life is that fruitless life of the hard path and the fruitless life of the, of the rocky path. And then there's a fruitless life of this uh, thorny path. And you get it here in verse 22. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. You, you may have seen this if you let your garden get away from you a time or two and thorns or thistles or weeds grow up in the garden. And, and there's some things that are going on there that, that absolutely, they destroy the life. So there is, uh, the, the thorns are, are drawing the nutrients and the moisture out of the soil and they're uh, robbing uh, what's good there. Uh, They're robbing it of of moisture and nutrients. So all of the good stuff meant to uh, bring life and thriving is going to the wrong thing. Also, sometimes the weeds, the thorns, the thistles, they grow up, and they grow up so high, they grow above the plants, and they begin to to shade them so that the sunlight is, is, it, it never really falls on what's intended to be flourishing there in that garden of your soul, if you will. So the choked word because of other things. And so two aspects to the choking here. The first aspect is the cares of this world. And the second is this, um, uh, the deceitfulness of riches. And both of these things are are weeds, are thorns that, that choke the vitality out of spiritual life and can destroy us. I really think what Jesus is talking about here is the thing that he expounded on at some length back in chapter 6 in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. You remember these words where he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are full of light, your whole, if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life 
what you will eat or drink or your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus here in the explanation of the parable is just succinctly saying what he expounded at some length there in Matthew chapter 6. And he puts the two aspects together, doesn't he? He puts worry together. We're not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. We're not to be anxious about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear. And, and then also earlier in the text, it's don't store up wealth here, but store it up over there. And so these two things, the deceitfulness of wealth and the cares of this world, they come together. Really what he's describing is, is, is worldliness. And when we set our hearts on the things of this world, then we are subject to worry. And we're subject to our affections, our love, our desire, our hopes, our desire for joy and happiness. All of that set on something God has made rather than on, on him. I think maybe we understand uh, anxiety and worry a little bit better than, uh, today than we did two or three weeks ago. Things are different now, aren't they? You want to go to the store and you kind of want to stock up a little bit because you're not sure it'll be available next week or even tomorrow. Uh, there's a temptation to do that. There's a temptation to lose sleep because you're worried. Will I have what I need? We need to hear the words of our Savior saying, look at the birds. You're much more valuable than they are. Your your Heavenly Father loves you. He's going to take care of you. There's no reason for you to worry. You can trust His greatness and His goodness. You can trust His wisdom. Even if you're deprived a little bit for a while, He has good purpose. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, He says to His people, uh, after He had done this before, Moses The Lord is reminding the people of God through Moses, he said, and he humbled you and let you hunger. (laughs) It's a pretty amazing statement. He humbled you and he let you hunger. We don't like God to think about God doing stuff like that. But in in, in, uh, the wilderness experience with his people, God absolutely did that. He humbled them and he let them hunger so that he could fill them and provide for them. And they'd be reminded of how utterly dependent upon him they are. And so let's be reminded of the same thing. Let's not, uh, let's not worry or be afraid. And then the second part of this, this choking that happens, is, is that by the deceitfulness of wealth. It doesn't say that wealth itself chokes. It says the deceitfulness of wealth chokes. So how does it do that? Wealth tells lies. Well, I guess wealth doesn't really tell lies. Wealth really isn't a lie, is it? But we tell ourselves lies about wealth, and the world tells us lies about wealth, and Satan tells us lies about wealth. You can kind of see it there, a little story Jesus shares in a similar context to this one that we're finding in Matthew 13 in Luke chapter 12. And in there is the story of this farmer that was enormously successful. He had such a bumper crop that he didn't have room for the crop. The harvest was too big. His barns were too small. So we thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my old small barns and I'll build bigger barns and I'll have room. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods stored up. So eat, drink, and be merry. Everything's going to be fine. And then the story goes that he found out that that night his soul was required of him. He was going to die and he wasn't going to get to experience the joy of any of that that he had 
amassed, that he had stored up those treasures he stored up on earth. And Jesus, uh, in that, uh, the context of that story, tells us that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things possessed. So the story helps us understand the lies, the deceitfulness of wealth. For, first of all, the, the, the first lie is that it's actually yours. And you, you, you think it belongs to you, that the money in your accounts or in your wallet or um, the possessions that you have, that they actually belong to you. Now, the Bible honors personal possession a bit, but it also says, Psalm 24, verse 1, the Lord says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So everything in the universe belongs to him. He's really the only owner. We're just tenant farmers and we're stewarding his possessions for a while. That's a lie. You think it's yours. It's, it's, really, it's really not. So beware of that danger. And then a second lie is that it will satisfy. I, I think Brooks is hitting on this in that first mountain concept that a lot of young people embrace their life. They begin their lives with this trajectory. I'm going to conquer the world. I've got this goal and this and this and this. I'm going to do all of that. And when I get on top of that mountain, I will be satisfied. I will be happy. This is the way I pursue joy and happiness by pursuing success and reputation and acquiring possessions and all of that. And when I, when I scale the mountain, then I'll be satisfied. You scale the mountain and you find out it, it, it doesn't satisfy. Because you're not made for that. You're made for the God who made those things, not for those things. It, it, it's a lie. And one of the great tragedies is if you just keep scaling that first mountain all your life and you never realize it's a lie. And, and you always think just a little bit more, just a little more success, a little more money, or a little more of this, or a little more of that, and then, and then, and then it'll do it. Then I'll finally be happy and I'll finally have joy and you spend your whole life with the carrot dangled out in front of you and, and you never get there. Don't let that happen to you. It's a lie. And then, and then, and then a third lie is that this, this joy that I have in my wealth will, will last, that somehow it's, it's permanent. And in the story there in Luke 12, it, 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 the joy didn't last because the man didn't last. His soul was required of him. He died under judgment because he wasn't. He was living for his stuff rather than living for the God who made the stuff and gave it to him. Don't let that happen to you. It's not going to last. So there's a couple of ways it won't last. One is when you, when you die, it'll be gone to you. You don't take it with you. You don't pull a U-Haul behind the hearse. It doesn't work that way. And so it could be like the farmer there in Luke 12. It ends when your life ends, or it could be that it's like what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on, on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, or where the stock market dips. And you thought you had this much, and now you only have this much. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last. And the joy related to it is, is temporary. These are, these are lies, but if you Loved ones, if you believe them, Jesus is saying here, it'll be the ruin of you. It will choke the life out of you. So let's lay down some application before we move on to the, the glory of the fruitful life. The first thing is this. We should self-examine. This story calls us to examine ourselves. We should ask the question, Am I really in, in Christ? And, and what's being said there is that these first three soils, none of these understand the message of the kingdom in, an, in, a, in a saving way. All of them fall short of that. I suppose the second and the third soil, there may be a little more understanding than the first, but it's not a saving understanding. There may be a, an element of belief, but it's not saving faith. Again, we already know this because Jesus said, Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So it's crucial that you examine yourself. You ask yourself the question, am I in Christ? Is there fruit? 
is the life completely choked out of me because I have given my heart over to, to worry and I have given my heart over to, to wealth and stuff. I have loved the world. Apostle John says in John chapter 2, verse 15, do not, do not love the world or anything in the world. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. If, if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not in you. As your love for the Father increases, your love for the world will decrease. If your love for the world is ascending, your love for the Father will be either non-existent or descending. So examine yourself. Are you in Christ? And if you, if you look at this and you come to the conclusion that the, the life is, is choked out of you or you sprung up with some hasty profession of faith that wasn't real uh, or you're just a hard path that has never even had an initial response to the gospel, then repent and believe. Hear the message of the kingdom that God sent his only son into the world to live the life you couldn't live, to live this perfect, righteous life never setting his heart on the things of this world, always having his heart, always on his Father and on the need of this world that he came to meet, lived an absolutely righteous life, went to the cross, died our death, bore the wrath of God for our sin and his body on the tree, bore our very sin and shame, paid for it, was buried on the third day and rose again. And the blessings of what he did there, what he accomplished here, are free to all who will break with a sin and turn to him in faith. And so do that. Let go of the stuff of this world and run to Christ and fall on him in faith. Follow, find new life in Christ alone. So examine yourself. You may in your examination find, yes, I believe I'm a Christian. I know that I have been saved. I know that I'm in Christ. But some of the realities Jesus is talking about here are true of me. There has, I have to admit, there's been some choking. I have to admit, there's been some anxiety that has not honored him. And so I want to begin to deal with those things in a positive way. I want to experience repentance about where I'm falling short, where Christ has not had my heart exclusively. I want the love of the Father and the love of Christ to be ascending, rising in my heart. I want, I want the love of this world to be de descending. Maybe just... In these moments, loved ones, maybe you, maybe you can see the good hand of your God in our present circumstances. The good, loving hand of your God, not just for the world and for the lost, but his good, loving hand for you. How he's stripping some things away, things that you've relied on and things that you've set your heart on. He's stripping some of those things away so that, so that you'll rest more fully on the crucified examine. Let's examine our hearts and see that. And then secondly, let's choke the chokers. Let's choke the chokers. So what, what we do is we let's choke the life out of the thorns in our lives. It, you know, you, you don't have to check the stock market six times a day. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do it once a day. You can just sort of set that aside. Uh, don't be pouring over that all the time. You don't have to track the spread of the coronavirus every moment of every day. If, if you're doing these kinds of things, what, what it's going to do is it's going to grow anxiety in your heart and it's going to, and it, it's going to be choking the, the life. It's going to be shading you from the sunlight and, and it's going to be drawing away the nutrients into things that aren't that important. And so choke the chokers by not giving mental attention to it because you you feed them by thinking about them, by obsessing over them, by worrying over them all the time. So seek God for grace to stop that. And then refuse the lies. Refuse to buy the, the lies that somehow these, the wealth does not satisfy and it doesn't belong to me anyway. Uh, and, it, and it will not last past this life, and it may not last past this week. And, and if it doesn't, I'll be okay. Because I'm not held by that stuff. 
I'm held by a Savior who loves me. And so you choke the chokers and, and then you give attention to things that matter. You, you ponder the things Jesus points us to in Matthew chapter 6. That there is a Father who loves sparrows and there is a, a Father who clothes lilies and you're worth a whole lot more than sparrows or lilies and He's going to take care of you. So you meditate on His greatness, His power, His sovereign rule over this world, everything that's happening even now, even this week. And you meditate on his goodness, that all of that strength and power is for you. And you meditate on his wisdom. That he knows exactly what you need. And if he's humbling you and letting you hunger so that he can feed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of, the, of God. If he's doing that, then it's, it's good for you. And you, can, and you can trust him with that. So you choke the thorn. And you let the life of God's word and God's spirit flow into you. And then, and then I haven't left much time for the glory of the fruitful life, but let's talk about that a little bit. Verse 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So what is what is the fruit? Matthew's talked a lot about it. What is it? My suggestion to you, because everything connects in the Gospel of Matthew, but my suggestion to you is this, that, that it's really the, the fruit is really where Jesus starts in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think it's those things. And if, if we were going to kind of just distill all of that into two words, I would say humility and mercy. Humility in your posture toward God. I, I realize my poverty of spirit, that apart from him, there's no good thing in, in me. I'm impoverished, and I'm dependent on him for righteousness, for, for, for goodness, for anything good in me or coming from me. I'm impoverished, but there's riches in Christ, and so it has me looking to him and not myself the poor in spirit. It has me mourning over my sin. Blessed are those who mourn. And it has me meek. And then hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And remember at the heels of all of that teaching about worry and, and, um, and loving wealth there in chapter 6, Jesus said at the end of it, um, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. And so this hungering and thirsting has us Seeking, that's, that's fruit, longing to have the righteousness that Christ offers positionally because his positive righteousness is given to us and all our sins are removed by his atoning death on the cross. So hungering for that, but also hungering for a practical righteousness where our hearts are actually changed and made more like him. That we have this, um, uh, this recognizing our poverty, mourning over our sin, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And then in the way we relate to others, we have this meekness, this mercy. Remember what we said all the way through, Matthew? We've said it over and over and over again. What is mercy? Mercy is what love looks like when the object of that love is in trouble. And right now at Rich Palm, we're going to have opportunities. We're still figuring out exactly what that looks like. But you need to be thinking and praying and reading your Bible. Think, what does mercy look like? Do you love your neighbors? The object of your love is in trouble. And so what does mercy look like? That's fruit. That's, that's fruit. Meekness toward one another. Meekness toward our neighbors. Mercy toward them. You remember that mercy has been a theme that's run all the way through that would lead us to make peace with those that we're at odds with or at odds with us. A mercy that would have us uh, tending to those that are in need around us. Remember twice in this gospel, Jesus quotes Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. 
that he desires, our God desires mercy and not sacrifice. I think that's what the fruit is. A heart with childlike faith, trusting in God to supply because the heart realizes it doesn't have the resources on its own. The resources are only found in him. And out of that humility, a heart that's disposed in mercy toward neighbor and toward brother and sister in Christ and toward the lost of this world, that would be the fruit. Aren't you hungry for that? Don't you long to be more and more that kind of man, that kind of woman, even that kind of boy, that kind of girl that's not obsessed with your own situation, really is thinking about how can I bear fruit that would, that would honor God. And then the, part of the glory of this is that there are distinctions and differences here. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and another 30. So I want to encourage you by this. Earlier, I was warning you, and I, and I, I meant the warning. You need to examine yourself. Am I really in Christ? But also, I don't want to afflict the afflicted by having you think about that. I really don't. You might think, well, I think there's some fruit. There's not as much as I wish there was. Maybe it's 30-fold. Well, Jesus is encouraging us, saying, even if there's not a lot of fruit, if there is some fruit, any fruit is, is evidence that there's life in you, that your life's been grasped by the gospel. We ought to, hung, we ought to hunger to be uh, that hundredfold fruit bearing, but you may just be 30, but be encouraged. If there's fruit there, then that's gospel fruit. That's God working that in you and working that out of you. Some 30, some 60, some 100. You may look around you and see a brother or sister that you think are bearing fruit a hundredfold, and you're encouraged by them. You believe you're 30, but you see evidence of fruit in their lives. Part of maybe what we ought to be doing in this season is when we see evidence of fruit in one another, we should just say that. You know, really see God doing this in your life or that in your life, and it encourages me. Thank you for trusting him. And I'm just thankful for the way God is doing that in your life. We could encourage one another in this difficult season in that way. And then, and then finally, I, I would just say part of the glory of the fruitful life is, is that it touches lives around us, but also that it, it brings glory to the, to the gardener, to the, to the sower in this context. And, and Jesus is that sower. The Father is that gardener. And in John chapter 15, uh, the Word of God says through, Jesus says that uh, it's, it's God's will that we bear much fruit to the Father's glory. It's to the Father's glory when we bear much fruit. So when I used to live in Christian County, I lived between two uh, uh, older men, uh, and they had gardens and Man, they were serious about the gardens, and every year it was a race to see who got the first ripe tomato and who got the best ripe tomato, and they had different ways of going at this. Uh, one guy, he, he, would, he was going to trim his vines. He was going to sucker his vines. That's the word. Uh, so that the fruit would grow big. And the other one said if the vines aren't healthy, then the fruit can't be healthy. And so they had these different philosophies, but they were racing over who got the biggest, best tomato and who got the first one. And all of that was about the glory of the garden. Every time it was about that gardener's glory. Well, we should want to bear fruit to the glory of our Father who looked our way in eternity past and the glory of our Christ who died and rose so that we would bear fruit for him. And the glory of the Spirit who in mercy touched your life and work repentance and faith into your heart and new life, and now it's working fruit out of you. We should long for that. So in the middle of this hard season, there are huge opportunities. I think, I think much of what God's been doing at Rich Pond in the last several years has probably just been preparation for this very season. Maybe what he's been doing in your life individually, what he's been doing in our life corporately and in other churches just preparing us for this very season that we would be ready to bear fruit for our Father's glory when the needs are so great and the opportunities are so great. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We, we feel our poverty and we mourn our sin. 
And we long to be fruitful. And we know we can't just make it happen by our own effort, but Lord, we would put ourselves in the path of this fruitful life. We would be in your word. We would be on our knees. We would, we would choke out our obsession with money and things, and we would n- refuse to believe the lies about our possessions. And we would, as you would give us grace, set our hearts on you. And we would set our hearts on our neighbors to love them well, to take the mercy we've received in this gospel and extend it to them for their sake and for your glory. Strengthen us in these things, Lord. And for those who do not know you, Lord, help them to see it, to see their need, and to repent of sins and trust in Jesus with all their heart. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray you have a great Lord's Day with what remains of us.